Good morning, and welcome morning. to worship here at Concord United Church this uh, Sunday, November 27th, the first Sunday of Advent. So welcome, whether you're here in the uh, congregation or whether you're at home watching uh, the live stream, or later on this week if you're watching via YouTube or the recording for the cable channel next Sunday. Welcome, one and all. So as we progress through worship, uh, there is responsive parts, as we are familiar with. Uh, I'll be reading anything that's printed in red, and the uh, black is what you respond to. So let us practice that this morning as we begin our worship with an acknowledgement of the land. We acknowledge the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek Nation. The people of the We further give thanks to the Chippewas of Saugeen and the Chippewas of Newash, now known as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land. Our thanks compel us to live fully into our journey of reconciliation, a seven generation process of intentional listening and learning. We seek to live together in respect, friendship, and peace. Now, uh, earlier this week, uh, I was talking with uh, Rod, and he was saying that uh, when it comes to the, uh, there is an announcement about the choir, uh, that he would be happy to leap from his choir position. And so without further ado. Thank you, Kevin, you're all hard. <laughs> I've been practicing that for a day. You'd think I'd get it right by now. So this afternoon at 3 o'clock, uh, the a cappella choir, which, of which I am a member, and actually I was saying in the choir room there are six people who are members or adherents of this church, belong uh, to this choir. We're performing this afternoon. We did a concert yesterday in Port Elgin United. It was warmly received by, uh, by an appreciative audience. Um, the admission is just by donation, whatever you choose to, um, uh, to contribute. Uh, if you prefer to stay home because it's... Um, um, more comfortable with you, uh, you can get the connection to the um, live streaming uh, through the Facebook page, which is which is mentioned there as well. The um, the uh, choir will have done rapid testing uh, to make sure that we're okay to perform, and we'll ask the audience to uh, to be masked because we think that's a reasonable accommodation to keep people safe. So. Um, if you have any more questions, just see me after the uh, service, but um, it's an enjoyable program. It covers four centuries of music from the 17th to the 21st century, so there's bound to be something you enjoy, and it's not a very lengthy program either, so hope to see some of you there. Thank you, Rod, and thank you for the introduction. For those who may not know me, my name is Kevin Hart. Uh, there's also uh, some uh, information about the photo directory. If you uh, did not order pictures and you still want to get a photo directory, please contact Melinda. Uh, the number is on the screen there. And uh, the Concard and Christmas Hamper gift card program, uh, donations are being accepted for the hamper. And uh, again, see the online announcement for more details. This is uh, obviously something that is uh, uh, really near and dear to some people's hearts at this time of year, tense for the homeless. Uh, I'm going to let you read through that, just give you a, a few seconds. Um, but obviously, for those folks who live on the margins, uh, certain supplies at this time of year are greatly appreciated. So we would invite you to, to think about that and uh, get in touch with the folks involved. Violence Against Women, it's a come and go vigil uh, Tuesday, December 6th from 7 to 9 p.m. And so that's a time to pay respect to the 14 women who were murdered at Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal in 1989 and, and to all women who have suffered from abuse uh, and violence. There will be a congregational meeting to consider the 2023 budget on December 11th shortly after the worship service. So please plan to participate in person or via the Zoom meeting platform. 
Giving Tuesday, that's coming up this Tuesday. Uh, and I will get back to that a little later. So just to, to know that uh, this is something that uh, happens around the world and our church affords us an opportunity. And there is uh, still time to subscribe to Broadview, uh, United Church Magazine, $25 for eight annual issues. Uh, again, uh, please uh, mail uh, or get in touch with the office by Tuesday, December 13th, if you would like to get a subscription. And so, as we prepare for worship, let us, as the church has done for thousands of years, offer each other the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And also, and also with, with you. you. So let us uh, still our hearts and our minds as we prepare for worship. I'd invite you to join me now in our call to worship and our prayer of approach based on the Old Testament lectionary reading for this Sunday. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, We look to you, O God, our judge and our hope. Teach us to put down our weapons of conflict, be they physical, mental, or spiritual, and transform them into tools of peace. So, That's red. Sorry, did I lie? So may we be better neighbors, not just to our friends, Sorry. but as Jesus taught, with our enemies as well. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. I, I, I'm not that old, but I think I just had a senior's moment. <laughs> <clears throat> so come let us sing uh, at this point in time, our opening hymn. Uh, more voices, number one, let us build a house.
Well, are you missing Reverend uh, Gord? He's still hanging around, as we just saw, but just not here. So it is the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, the four themes of Advent, uh, hope and peace and joy and love. And so this first Sunday of Advent, we light the, the, the candle of hope. So I'm going to invite Pam to come up. And as we go through the liturgy, when the time comes, she's going to light the candle for us. So please join me, and I'll try and follow along in, in my part this time. <laughs> Arise and be bold. Good news of hope is here. The warm glow of the divine lightens our hearts. Here we are together, not alone. We join with the cloud of witnesses here, there, elsewhere, and everywhere. On this first Sunday of Advent, we will dream and imagine a different future, a rising up and a life flourishing one. We are witnesses to hope. Thank you, Pam. Our habit of hope and hoping finds sustenance and meaning in God's promise of the fullness of life. And so let us pray. God of righteous dream, lighten our hearts with the enlarged imagination to dream new possibilities, to imagine a world where transformation will happen, where creation is mended and restored, and where exiles and strangers will find a home. And now, a voice from on high shall lead us in a, a simple teaching. So the survivor flag is an expression of remembrance meant to honor residential school survivors and all the lives and communities impacted by the residential school system in Canada. Each element depicted on the flag was carefully selected by survivors from across Canada. They were consulted in the flag's creation, and here is what it looks like after that careful consultation. We learned about the family depicted on the flag. Some saw the adults as our ancestors watching over us. Others saw these as parents, signifying whole families ripped apart, and also reuniting to represent healing. We learned about the children depicted on the flag. More than one child is depicted in the design as often whole sibling groups were taken from their parents, taken from younger siblings, from grandparents, and from community. And we learned about the seeds below ground depicted on the flag. They represent the spirits of the children who never returned home. Although they have always been present, they are now seen and searched for. We learned about the tree of peace depicted on the flag. Haudenosaunee, sorry, Haudenosaunee, thank you. My mouth sometimes doesn't do what my brain tells me. Haudenosaunee symbol of how nations were united and brought to peace, which in turn provides protection, comfort, and renewal. We learned about the cedar branch depicted on the flag. Sacred medicine that represents protection and healing, but it is also what is used by some indigenous cultures when one enters the physical world, and then again when they pass on to the next. The seven branches acknowledges the seven sacred teachings taught in many indigenous cultures. Then we learned about the cosmic symbolism on the flag. The circle represents the sun, moon, and in it the stars and planets. The sun represents the divine protection that ensure those who survived came home. The North Star is prominent as it is an important navigation guide for many indigenous cultures. <clears throat> we learned about the Métis sash on the flag. The sash is a prominent ceremonial regalia 
worn with pride. Certain colors of the thread represent lives that were lost, while others signal connectedness as humans and as resilience through trauma. All the threads woven together spell out part of history, but no single thread defines the whole story. And then we learned about the eagle feather depicted on the flag. The eagle feather represents that the creator spirit is among us. It is depicted pointing upwards, which mirrors how it is held when one speaks their truth. This week, the last week, we learn about the, oh, sorry, I'm gonna screw it up again, Inuxut, Inuxut depicted on the flag. Inuxuts are used as navigational guides for Inuit people, and they're linked to tradition. For thousands of years, Inuit used Inuxuts as markers for survival and the North Star for navigation. Their inclusion in this design carries this meaning, that our culture withstood colonial onslaught, onslaught and our traditional ways will continue to guide us. Jack Anawak, Inuk survivor who attended Chesterfield Inlet Residential School. I was part of the last generation born and raised on the traditional lands of the Inuit before forced relocation into mainstream communities. Inuit children were further relocated and placed in residential schools in regions throughout Canada. Many are not familiar with how Inuit lives were impacted by residential schools. So it was important to see ourselves in an image that honors our truth as survivors. Mata Evalu Arduk Palmer, Inuit survivor who attended Churchill Residential School. Edna Eli Elias, Inuk survivor who attended Stringer Hall Residential School says, I was delighted to be asked to be part of a national collaboration of survivors for this project. It is not only important that this design reflect that Inuit were also impacted by the residential school system, but the symbolism of our culture, a reminder of the very thing we Inuit survivors have fought to preserve for our future generations. There will be on the website um, next week a, a link to where all of this information can be found, so if you want to uh, look at it again, it will be there for you. And let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. God, God within us, us God, God beyond, beyond us, us, God among us, us. may the mystery always be named and known among, among all peoples and in all times. times. May creation give way to the rule of love and the power of life. Satisfy our hunger, granting us a hunger to see the whole world fed. Restore us to right relationship with you, with creation, with others, with ourselves. Strengthen us to reject all that would lead us away from you. Come to us when we choose death over life. Give us courage to follow your call in this moment. For in your love we find the only power, the only home, the only honor we will ever need in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Our first Bible reading is from Romans chapter 13, verses 11 to 14 in the New Testament. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Let us now sing When I Needed a Neighbor, Voices United, number 600. <laughs> Our gospel reading for this morning comes from Matthew 24, verses 36 to 44. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, and one will be taken, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken, and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Gracious Lord, open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to your word for us this day, through Jesus Christ. Amen. Waiting and watching, hoping and dreaming. Now, these are words and ideas with which we should all be somewhat familiar in one way or the other after the last couple of years. Waiting and watching, 
hoping and dreaming, waiting for the pandemic to run its course, hoping and dreaming for things to get back to normal, and still wondering, perhaps like the illustration of the woman in our title slide, whether either of these things shall ever come to pass. The woman is obviously on a journey and appears to be and appears to have a reflective demeanor as the countryside passes steadily by out the train window. And though we aren't on a train ourselves, we are at the beginning of a figurative journey. And of course I speak of our journey through Advent as we prepare for the coming of our Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. And that is something worth waiting and watching for, something worth hoping and dreaming about. But just to be clear, I'm not talking about a countdown to Christmas, these four weeks of Advent. Advent calendars filled with chocolates and toys and bonbons notwithstanding, Advent is not, I repeat, it is not a countdown to Christmas. It is a season unto itself, and it is a time for us to prepare ourselves for God's coming, for God's presence in and among us. It's a time for us to look outward, to see where the light of God and the love of God and God's healing touch is most needed in our world. And it is a time for us to hope for and to imagine a world at peace. After all, aren't these the things that we're all deeply longing for in our hearts? To know that we live in God's world and that we are loved and cared for? Isn't it what we want for the whole world? The reading from the second chapter of Isaiah that we shared at the beginning of this service is just such a hopeful imagining. In the first chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah, as prophets are one to do, has spelled out for the people all of the things that they had done to displease and separate themselves from the love of God. Now, he shares with them a vision of Jerusalem, the city of God, restored as a light amongst all the nations, and a place where the world comes to learn of peace, the way of peace. Now Isaiah's words would have been written or uttered about 2,600 years ago, and we're still waiting hoping and dreaming, along with many billions of others, for some such event to happen someplace, sometime. So, it is a pretty wistful dream after all. I'm looking at the picture of this woman on the train again. Like, can you imagine such a thing? The whole world at peace? The whole world? Humankind collectively has seen the light and realizes that war solves nothing. So instead of producing and deploying weapons of war with nation fighting against nation, nations have decided to cooperate. The lion has decided to lay down with the lamb. And we are using and producing new technologies, agricultural and old technologies, to feed billions of hungry mouths around the world. And just in case you're thinking, it's not really possible, is it? Think about what's happened over the last three years, how the global community has come together to help solve this crisis, to help find a way to heal and cure people from COVID. may be wistful, but I am hopeful for a better future for all of humanity, 
based on what we have seen over the last couple of years. And it is fine and good to have hopes and dreams for the future, even such lofty ones as world peace. But realizing any such hope or any such dream requires us to deal with the present, to live and love and act in the present. And such was the case with both Jesus' own disciples and his earlier followers, or his early followers in Rome, addressed by Paul in the other readings we heard this morning. Along with the very temporal uh, themes of watchfulness and wakefulness, there are exhortations to live an intentional as opposed to a frivolous life, let's say. In both cases, Jesus' followers are essentially being told to hang in there. Things may feel a little rough or shaky right now, but those who endure till the end shall be saved. For remember that Judea at the time was being occupied by the Romans. As Jesus assures them, that a time is coming. No one knows the hour or the day, but a time is coming when God will set things right. And so Jesus invokes the story of the flood and uses images of a a kidnapper and a thief to underscore the need to be aware of what is happening in the world around us, in our present time. And in the brief passage from uh, the letters to the Romans, there appears to be an urgent appeal to come to their senses. It's now the moment for you to wake up from your slumber. Then there's an appeal to live that intentional life, cast as the battle of light over darkness. What are we going to choose? And in those troubling times, Paul reminded his audience that putting on or clothing oneself with the Lord Jesus Christ would help to secure one's salvation. The present is fraught with all kinds of obstacles and challenges to our salvation, to our peace, to justice, to healing, and and to reconciliation. All of these things that underpin the kingdom of God, and that we hope and pray and dream about every time we recite the Lord's prayer prayer, and pray for thy kingdom to come, thy will to be done on earth as in heaven. So I believe that in these readings, we, along with the faithful throughout the ages, are being asked to face these real and present realities, these obstacles and challenges, and not to turn our backs on them. And so when I return to Isaiah's vision, an imagery of swords being beaten into plowshares, which we paraphrased this morning, my heart can't help but go out to the people of Ukraine. All of our hopes and dreams for peace are absolute flights of fancy when held up against this darkness in our present time. In this time of Advent, we prepare to celebrate the coming of God's light into the world. We begin to plan and prepare for hopefully unrestricted Christmas gatherings with friends and family all in the warmth and safety of our homes. And we ask ourselves, where is God's light and healing touch needed? And so when I think of the people of the Ukraine, who especially because of the cruel war being waged directly against them, 
and the infrastructure needed for them, for their very survival, for heat, for electricity, for water, for food, all of it scarce at best. And I realize that they are in for a long, hard, nasty winter. I literally shiver just to think about it. Their preparations, their celebrations, their hopes and dreams for peace, I'm certain, will look somewhat different from ours. So in this time of Advent, we ask ourselves, what can we do to help shed God's light into some of the dark corners of the world? You will recall that I said I'd get back to Giving Tuesday a little later. Here we are, a little later. Giving Tuesday started nine years ago, a movement that is now embraced by people and organizations around the world, including our United Church of Canada. So from the Giving Tuesday website, just to give you a brief understanding of what Giving Tuesday is about, it's a movement that unleashes the power of radical generosity around the world. Giving Tuesday reimagines a world built upon shared humanity and generosity. Our global network collaborates year-round to inspire generosity around the world with a common mission to build a world where generosity is part of everyday life. Whether it's making someone smile, helping a neighbor or a stranger out, showing up for an issue or people we care about, or giving some of what we have to those who need our help, every act of generosity counts. And everyone has something to give. And so to follow up on that from our United Church of Canada website, their uh, overview of what Giving Tuesday means this year for them as a church and what they would do if you decided to donate this coming Tuesday. People facing, this is, was posted on October 20th, so it's just over a month old, and it was in preparation for Giving Tuesday. People facing the worst crisis of their lives urgently need our support. While some refugees are returning to Ukraine, over six million are still displaced and have no home to return to. COVID-19 cases are starting to rise again, and some countries still have no access to vaccines or boosters. Another way our United Church helps in this time of crisis. In Africa, food prices are soaring, leaving 146 million people hungry. That's not to mention the effects of any of the droughts that are still happening, ongoing in Africa. Entire communities in Pakistan are left without shelter, farmland, health care facilities, and basic necessities of life because of flooding and landslides. And the tagline at the end, after the headlines fade, the emergency remains. You can help. So this year, Giving Tuesday gifts will support the United Church's vital emergency response work. All of those things that I just named and anything else around the world that has come to be uh, at the forefront of the headlines and beyond. Your gifts will be put to work as soon as they are needed in the areas where they are needed most. And your support will be there to help rebuild long after the headlines fade. Every gift counts make a life-saving gift this Tuesday. So that's our United Church making an appeal. And God knows we're all too familiar with appeals at this time of year. However, we are beginning our journey through Advent. When we leave this time and place behind us, we might want to reflect over the next few days on what we have heard and what we have seen in our mind's eye, perhaps like the woman staring out the train. 
we might want to ask ourselves a question I have asked a couple of times already, so I'll ask it one more time. Where do I see the need for the light and the healing touch of God in the world, in our community, in our lives? When and if you come up with an answer, perhaps by this Tuesday, you might want to do, as Paul suggests, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and follow up with a word or a deed, even a simple prayer to lighten up someone else's life. All my relations, that they all may be one. And so I've taken from the United Church website the prayer for Giving Tuesday and offered as our community prayer. So again, I, I'd encourage you to think about what you've heard and what you've seen in your mind's eye already this morning, the people that you love and that you care for. Uh, and I'll pray this prayer, give ourselves a few quiet moments to raise up our own private concerns and prayers. Let us pray. O oh God, the season of waiting has begun. We wait with gratitude for the gift of love at Christmas. As we strive to find gifts to express our appreciation for those who make our world and lives better, may our gifts have more meaning. May our gifts share your vision of love in the world. Giving Tuesday is our opportunity to look beyond the sales flyers and promotional emails and see a new way forward, a way for healing and connection. We live in a world of consuming, a world where the person with the most toys wins, and yet you offer us a way filled with grace. On this Giving Tuesday, help us to give freely from the heart. We pray that our gifts will bring hope to the lost, peace to the hungry, love to the lonely, and joy everlasting. A way where each of us has a piece of your heart to share with others. A way where we do not win until we give, and in giving, our hearts are filled. O oh God, may we be able to joyfully share our gifts with many, with the vision of a better tomorrow, knowing that when we do so, we become like the Magi of old, offering our gifts to the refugee child, the child living on the margins, a child born in a stable in Bethlehem. Amen. Thank you, John, God, for hearing these prayers. We hold up the prayers of our hearts and we lift them up to your heart. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, thank you for that rousing anthem, choir. <laughs> and it is so nice to have a choir and, and rousing anthems again, isn't it? So the time has come for us. We've heard all about giving, and I, I hardly feel like I need to, to make an invitation for our offering. But again, there are needs, both near and far, for which we can make a difference in our world. So let us prepare to make our offering, and I'd invite uh, our little uh, cart to be wheeled up as, uh, as we do that. So it is Food Bank Sunday, and it looks like uh, we've had a few generous uh, offerings, so to speak. That'll help a few hungry mouths over the holidays. Let us join together in our prayer of dedication. O oh God, accept the money offered, accept our gifts given, accept the goodwill of our hearts for those who will receive, so that disappointment may be replaced by joy. Worry may be replaced by happiness. Hopelessness may be replaced by a sense of purpose. Rejection may be replaced by acceptance. And your ordinary meal may become our feast. Bless all our gifts, for we await with wonder the birth of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> our closing hymn will be Teach Me God to Wonder. Teach me God to dream, teach me God to hope, teach me God to wonder. Let us sing together, VU 299. <laughs> And so, the joys and the hard places of the world await us, but we have been fed with spiritual food. We have, we have been, been encouraged as a faith community. We, we have, have been motivated to serve the powerless. We have been challenged as those who own the name of Jesus Christ. We leave with Advent hope in our hearts. 